Hi, my name is Etta King, and I'm the Education Program Manager at the Jewish Women's Archive. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to use oral history to make B'nai Mitzvah more meaningful for both young people and their families. To start, you probably want to know more about what oral history is. Basically, oral history is the collection of stories and historical events and anecdotes from people through a series of planned interviews. In some cases, his, in the case of historians, for example, the interviews are recorded and archived in an archive or in a library or used for research for books or other historical accounts. And in other cases, like in our case, oral history is a little bit more casual and is basically a structure that allows for intergenerational conversations within families and communities. Oral history is interesting and useful for a lot of reasons. Mostly, it's good for opening the door to learning more about history, about individual stories, and shedding light on stories that we maybe didn't know about in the past. Oral history also gives us the opportunity to learn about the specific. So when we're learning about history, we learn about the events, we study timelines, we sort of learn these benchmarks of chronology and, and what has happened. Um, but when we use oral history and we're asking specific questions to an individual, it allows their subjective experience to inform what we already know. So if you're having a conversation with an aunt or a grandmother um, talking about historical events, you can learn not just what the event is, what happened, but also what their feelings were, what the experience like was for them, and how that experience made them who they are. And these are the stories that we really want to get at when we're doing oral history interviews with young people, opening the doors for conversation and creating opportunities for young people to learn about what it means to be a Jew, what does it mean to be an adult, and explore that a little bit more with people who they know, have strong relationships with, and look up to. So then, of course, it begs the question, what's so special about B'nai Mitzvah? What's important about this time? So while what's happening on the Bima or perhaps in your community through a service project or some other celebration of this ritual is important, this is only the beginning of a process of being a Jewish adult, of participating in this community. So one reason bringing oral history in at this point in a young person's life is important is it helps give them both tools and experience for having these sorts of conversations. So as young people, you know, it, you're used to, as a young person, you're used to listening to what stories your grandfather tells or listening to the same sort of stories that come around out around family holidays and celebrations and things like that. But it's not very often as a young person that you are given the opportunity to ask questions and set the agenda for a conversation. It also is a little bit more intentional. It's a young person saying, I want to tell, I want to hear your story. This is what I want to know. And an older relative or, or community member saying, this is my story. I'm so glad you're listening. Here's what I think is important. And that dialogue opens a lot of opportunity for younger people to grow into their roles as members in this community. So it allows them to see themselves less as I'm a kid and you're an adult and these are my roles and more on this continuum of history within the family and also on, on a larger continuum of, of Jewish experience in the United States or in whatever community that you're a part of. So by using oral history we sort of help to create this place of transition and this moment of, of change within our families and within our communities and allow a little bit of wiggle room for young people to explore some of the questions that they're grappling with on the beginning of this journey. Another reason why oral history can be so fantastic is that it opens up opportunity for questions from young people to those of us who have been adults in the community a little bit longer. We struggle and have struggled with Judaism, how we identify, what things are important, what we believe, and all of those pieces come into play in our personal stories. So creating opportunities to share those struggles, to share the things that we've been confused about, and to share the things that we know or believe for sure are all fantastic chances 
for young people to look at what options are available to them. So by having interviews with several people, several role models from the community, a young person can start to see, oh, we all identify as Jews, but this person feels this way and this person feels this way. And they can start to see what, what are the different ways of, of being Jewish. What are the different things that we can do that show or make us feel that we are Jewish? And those opportunities and options open up a, a chance for young people to think more critically about who they want to be and more concretely about who they will be as Jewish adults. Lastly, starting these conversations now at a time when young people can feel a little bit awkward, sometimes you don't know your relatives very well because they live far away, um, starting these conversations now, opening the avenue of communication at this point in time creates more opportunities to have those conversations for the rest of your life. So it's easy to say, okay, well maybe at the age of 18 or 20 or 22 when someone's sort of a young adult and really thinking a little bit more concretely about what their adult lives will look like, perhaps those are good times to have these conversations. The problem with that is that first of all, sometimes our relatives aren't around anymore they've passed away or we've moved away to different places and they're harder to, to reach and, and be in touch with. Um, and so we miss an opportunity to really create meaning and, and engage with the stories of our relatives and of our family history. Um, another reason is that as teens, sometimes you're not exactly sure how to have a conversation with somebody who's much older or that feels awkward or a little bit intimidating and by using the framework of an interview it sort of puts the conversation in this space of uh, it's okay for me to have a list of questions and it's okay for me to feel a little bit uncomfortable and those conversations over the, the course of the conversation over the course of several conversations will allow that to be a little bit more um, it, allow, it allows the conversation to flow a little bit more and, and for young people to feel a little bit more comfortable opening up and asking questions. And that leads to later, outside of an interview context, sharing more stories and, and asking those questions a little bit more organically. So first, before I get into tips, I think it's important also to say that in oral history, we use specific words to describe the different roles. So the person who is conducting the interview is called the interviewer, and the person who's being interviewed is called the narrator. And in an oral history interview, the interviewer and the narrator have a conversation with one another. And it's usually best to sort of limit the other people that are in the room to allow the conversation to progress and the interview to progress as it would naturally. Um, but it's also something to think about if this is going to be a project that you're doing with a young person that you can record the interview or perhaps invite some other young family members to participate um, and use either community or family gatherings as an opportunity to do some collection of oral history and sharing of these family stories or use technology to share those with your family, even if your family isn't together. So if, for example, someone is interviewing a grandparent, you can put that video on YouTube or Dropbox, the video file to other family members, and give everyone the opportunity to hear the story that's being told. So before I go, I just want to leave you with a few practical tips for starting an oral history interview for conducting an oral history interview that you can use or you can pass on to students and kids that you're working with. Um, we have many more resources about oral history on the Jewish Women's Archive website and I'm always happy to help you um, so feel free to contact me by email or phone and we can talk more about this. So in terms of tips, there are sort of four basic guidelines that I think are important to remember when you're doing an oral history interview. The first is to remember to alternate between kinds of questions. So we use open-ended questions and closed-ended questions. 
close-ended questions are sort of more factual, right? They're asking, when were you born? Where did you grow up? What, what, did, what school did you go to? Um, and those are great for sort of framing the interview, creating a structure in, of this person's life or of a specific event. Um, and then you want to pair those with open-ended questions, which allow the narrator to talk a little bit more about um, their feelings and experiences. So if you're asking, for example, when did you go to college or did you go to college and when did you go to college, those are close-ended questions. And then you'll, you could follow the, that with, and what was that like for you? What was challenging about going to college? What was the experience like of being a woman at college at that time? And those questions allow the narrator to share a little bit more about their experience. And that gets at the subjective part of history that sort of builds up to this larger story that we're learning about. The second thing you want to remember is to listen. And active listening can look many different ways. But when you're doing an interview, especially if you're audio or video recording the interview, it's important to listen not using your voice. So sometimes when we're listening to somebody, we can affirm what they're saying and say, mm-hmm, yeah, wow, I feel that way too, that seems difficult. Um, when you're conducting an oral is history interview, it's best to sort of do that affirmation and that recognition of your active listening non-verbally so that you don't interrupt the train of thought of the narrator. So instead, use your you know, head and nod or smile or seem concerned, depending on what the story is, and sort of recognize the narrator's feelings, but try your best not to interrupt them. The third thing is to remember that it's an interview, but not a play. So we've created an interview, we have a list of questions, and that sort of gives us a script of this is what we're gonna talk about, but don't feel like you have to stick to that. So if the narrator starts talking about something else that seems interesting, ask some follow-up questions. Follow your instincts, follow what's interesting to you. And when you follow that, that's when the stories come out that are especially interesting and meaningful. Um, and at, as you follow those stories, if it seems like you're getting off track or you're running out of time and there are other things you wanna know about, then look back at your question list and see, okay, these are the things that I still wanna make sure that we're talking about. And the last basic tip I have is to remember that it's, although you as the interviewer are leading the interview, it's your narrator's story. So ultimately, you get to decide what it means for you if you're going to write something about it, an article, or you're writing a report about it, or you're including it in a, a book or a collection. You can frame it however you want and add your own opinion later. But in the interview, it's the narrator's story. So allow them to share what is important to them, and also don't push them if they feel like they don't want to share something. So while we're allowed to steer the interview, the narrator really gets to step on the gas and, and use the brake and decide when we're going to start talking about something or when they don't want to share about something anymore. And it's important to, to respect that, to make sure that they feel safe in the interview and want to share as many stories with you as possible. Thank you so much for watching. I know this has been a quick video, but we have many, many more resources for doing oral history online. All of them are free and available on JWA.org. And I'm always happy to help you or connect you with other people who are doing oral history projects with students and help you figure out how to bring these stories into your community and into your work with your students. Thanks so much.